So we're going to take a quick look back uh, in this lecture at uh, tension structures, in particular cable stayed and suspension structures. And we've looked at these before, again, when we were looking at form active simple structures, right? Arches and cables tend to be long spans almost no matter what. So we've covered some of this before. I want to go back and look at uh, cable stayed in particular uh, as an architectural solution and look at some of the finer points uh, of their behavior that maybe we wouldn't have gotten so much in 346, but should be pretty evident uh, now. To do this, I want to go back to this uh, really great structural project in the 1920s by the great Spanish engineer Eduardo Toroja. Toroja was uh, commissioned to redesign an aqueduct uh, in Spain. And here you can see the original design, which involved putting these big columns out in the middle of a, of a river classic long span project, right? A, a, a big area that you want to bridge over uh, and needing some way to do it other than what in this case would have been a very, very simple post and beam system, right? A 66 foot or about 20 meter span. The problem was that nobody wanted to dig these deep foundations in the, in the middle of the river. So Toroja's uh, solution was to do a very, very simple, very elegant cable stayed structure and basically to eliminate these middle two uh, columns or these middle two piers. Here in the final design, you can see that this goes from being a 66 foot span, which is a big span, but something that's doable uh, in post and beam construction to being a really big span, right? 200 feet where you absolutely need to do something uh, a little more dramatic, right? Beyond simple uh, bending structures. So what Toroja does is he uh, designs these two towers, compression structures, on either bank and he takes them up beyond the level of the aqueduct and then he includes these tension members here. These of course are going to take the place of these piers in the middle of the river and each one of those then has a corresponding backstay, uh, a tension element that's going to balance the weight of this piece of the aqueduct with the weight of the aqueduct back here, right? Essentially balancing the tower so that the tower isn't experiencing any uh, unequal stress in the, or unequal forces in the horizontal direction. Uh, everything is in equilibrium in the X direction. And the cables, of course, are going to be in tension. They're lifting the bridge up, so they'll be pulling down on the tower, and the tower will be in compression uh, pushing back up. And you can see there's some very clever things that he's done here. This middle piece of the aqueduct is now just a simply supported span, just like in the original, right? About 66 feet, 20 meters. Um, and you can see the little detail there. The shelf detail shows that it's very clearly resting uh, on the, the, um, the, the cable supported spans. And notice that it doesn't know, right? This middle piece doesn't know that it's being held up by cables. Uh, it's still going to experience the vertical reaction of those two elements on, on either side. It's just that now those pieces are being held in place, not by compression elements below, but by tension elements uh, up on top. So there's some interesting kind of fine points here, right? One is the, the role of the backstays in keeping the towers uh, in equilibrium and balancing the towers from left to right. Uh, even as they're adding more uh, load to the to the tower and compression. Second thing is this simply supported piece in the middle, right? So two basically long, we can think of these as cantilevers if you want, uh, and then a simply supported beam in the middle. You may remember the Firth of Fourth Bridge that we looked at as a great example of cantilever bridge construction. It's exactly the same principle. And then two things that I think are, are, are really interesting, one of which is really important, the other of which is just kind of clever. Um, if you look at this diagram over here in the upper right, you can see that this shows Toroja thinking about uh, the stresses within those tension elements and pulling up, of course, right? They're, they're above the, the level of the aqueduct, so they're pulling up on those segments, but also notice that they're pulling back. And Toroja realizes that the reaction that's going to happen right here and here, where the tension elements join the aqueduct, they're not only going to be uh, lifting the, the aqueduct up or holding it up, they're going to be imparting a very, very significant compressive stress into the aqueduct itself. In other words, they're pulling up, but they're also pulling back. And that means that Troja has to design 
these, as these elements of the aqueduct as essentially horizontal columns. And the shallower the tension members get, the greater the horizontal force. If you think about the angle as that angle gets shallower and shallower, the weight getting translated into that angled support is going to be more and more and more horizontal, right? It's like the opposite problem of a shallow arch. In a shallow arch, the thrusts get greater and greater as the arch gets shallower because more and more of the weight of the arch is getting translated into a horizontal force. Here, the same things happen. If he had the money to build those towers twice as tall, the angle would be greater and the horizontal force within the aqueduct would, would be less. So this is always an issue in cable state structures. We're always designing not just the compression elements that hold things up, we're designing uh, or the, the tension elements. We're also designing compression elements, of course, to, to keep those cables or those tension elements up in the air. And we're usually designing a bridge deck or a roof, or in this case, the aqueduct, as a compression number that is handling the horizontal force within that this very shallow cable. All right, so that's one sort of fine point to, to this cable state structure. Um, it's also important, this is something we always worry about in cable state structures. Here's what I, what I wanna point out is just a really, really clever solution. How do you make sure that those cables are always taut, right? In other words, uh, how do you make sure that the geometry is such that the cables are actually fully uh, engaged all the time? And what Toroha did is during construction, uh, he built the towers uh, slightly lower. You can see that the top bits of these are actually uh, separated from the, from the bottom. The cables are run over the top. You can see that they're encased in concrete. Uh, but then before they're encased in concrete, Toroha actually includes hydraulic jacks, sacrificial jacks that are cast into the concrete. Uh, once they're placed, he actually raises them up so that they uh, tighten all of the cables as they go. And then the jacks were cast themselves into the concrete uh, so that they were permanently there. And that's the way Toroha made sure that the cables were fully engaged, that they were fully loaded uh, before they were encased uh, in concrete. Um, we don't typically do this. It's just one of these little details that um, you see a, a really smart engineer at work and realize how well he understands uh, the, the, the problems that he's dealing with and coming up with a, a, a very clever solution for making sure that those cables are doing as much work uh, as, as he can get out of them. This is called pre-stressing, right? Making sure that the, the cables are taut uh, before everything is sort of finally put together. And if you look closely, you can see right there is where those uh, jacks were permanently cast into the, into the concrete. So cable state structures we often see in long span structures like say aircraft hangars. Um, and if you think about it, aircraft hangars always are going to have this problem of shallow cables because we don't want to build tall structures near a place where airplanes are taking off and landing, right? There are height restrictions uh, around airports. So in the 50s, there are all of these hangars. Here's one at, uh, at Kansas City that use the cable state principle, which is ideal, right? Very often you have a kind of maintenance shop or something in the middle and you want a big airplanes to be able to come in and out on the edges. So it makes perfect sense that you would concentrate the structure, concentrate the heavy compressive elements uh, in the middle, and then support the roof with cables so that you literally have nothing uh, out here at the end, right? Except for, except for the doors. So the problem of course, is that limiting the height of that middle, that center frame, uh, means that the cables are going to be very shallow, especially out here. And therefore that roof deck has to be designed to take pretty high compressive loads. If you think about it, this cable is taking the weight of this part of the roof. So that part of the roof is pulling down. The cable is certainly pulling up, but notice that because it's a very shallow angle, it's pulling back more than it's pulling up. And therefore that roof is going to have to develop a compression load, it's gonna to have to push back against the cable, if you like, uh, that's pretty significant. And you can see that as that compression load builds up, Amon and Whitney, the engineers have to actually thicken the roof as it comes into the, uh, to the, to the center support. Other than that though, this is a fairly straightforward structure. You can see it's symmetrically loaded. So they are using the weight of the roof on one side to balance the weight of the roof on the other. Uh, this is very clearly a moment frame, right? A, a thick 
set of, in this case, you can see shear walls uh, marching down the, the, the line of the hanger. And that those shear walls are gonna balance out any unequal forces if there's wind or something uh, that, that, that's trying to lift one side up or push one side down. That shear wall is capable of taking a little bit of bending uh, in either direction. And then you can see too the giant foundations, right? These not only have to take uh, the, the, the weight of the, um, the weight of the roof, the weight of the frame, but they have to balance any overturning forces, right? A, a wind that gets in underneath one of the doors is going to try to lift the building up. And so the, the downwind foundation is going to have to be uh, big enough to handle the, the overturning moment. And if you look closely, you can see that the details here, these are typically pin connections. Uh, cables, because they end up being long, they're made of steel, which is ductile. Uh, there will be some deflection, there will be some play uh, in this roof. And the detailing has to allow for a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of movement uh, in, all of the, in all of the members. Uh, another uh, building from the same era, this is, is one of my favorite cable state buildings because it's architecturally very clever. Uh, this was a, a, a terminal at uh, JFK Airport done in 1959. If you look at this section, you can see that um, it's, a, it's a, a fairly clever structure to begin with. Here are, we have masts that go around an elliptical plan, which is kind of interesting. Um, you can see there are pin connections there and there, so the roof can sort of rock back and forth a little bit. And then from the top, we have cables that hold up this big overhanging roof designed to keep rain off of people uh, coming out of the terminal and getting onto planes. This is in the era before enclosed jet bridges. And a cable going back then from the tower that balances that cantilever. And you can see that it's unequal, right? There's a much, much bigger span out over the aircraft than there is inside the terminal. And so what the engineers here have done is they've basically buried a giant concrete anchor and they've weighed down the cable backstays with vertical tensile struts, fancy name for cables, that are then embedded in the concrete. You can see they've drawn this detail here. It's almost like a, a kind of cotter pin or something that's pulling back uh, up against the concrete. So in this case, it's the weight of the concrete that is balancing the span and the weight of the cantilevered roof. The fact that they're connected, of course, helps to even things out, but really it's that concrete uh, that's doing the work. Unlike the hangar where one roof was balancing the other, <clears throat> here we have a, a, a dead weight underground that's balancing the weight uh, of, the, of the roof itself. Now, why is it architecturally clever? Well, you can see that the architects here have thought very carefully about the low rake of the cables and what you actually see as you're approaching the terminal. And they worked hard to keep the towers and the cables low enough that as you were approaching it, all you see is this very thin floating disc. You can see that the, just like any good cantilever, the roof tapers to almost nothing at the end, deeper at the root. And that thin edge is what you see as you're driving up to it. So the illusion is that it's this very, very uh, light, thin floating disc sort of magically supported above this glass canopy. In reality, there are not only these giant masts and cables holding it up, which are kind of hidden, but also hidden, and maybe more to the point, there's a huge whacking great piece of concrete that's buried underneath the table, uh, underneath the, um, the, 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 the ground, that's acting basically to hold the, uh, the, the roof down, right? To, to balance out to the edge of the roof as if this were a giant uh, teeter-totter. We've looked at this one before. This is the kind of classic cable stayed roof. Um, and Richard Rogers and partners working with Ove Arabs uh, designed this not only to be an efficient roof, but also to be one that really kind of explained itself uh, as it went. This is out in the middle of a suburban office park, so there's no real worry about height. You're not getting in the way of, of planes taking off or landing. So you can see that the towers here are much higher, and those main cables have a much, much steeper rake, which takes a lot of the compressive stress out of uh, the roof itself. In section, you can see, too, that they've been clever about where that cable uh, is anchored and how that anchor then supports the various roof purlins underneath it. And here, that uh, tension ring, right, it's in tension because everything is pulling against it, 
uh, helps to balance out uh, this, what would otherwise be a, a big compressive force in the roof. It's pulling uh, this way uh, and it's pulling this way. So it ends up uh, balancing the, the, uh, the force in this cable versus the force uh, in that cable. Roof can be thinner uh, as a result. Compression structure here, structure here, you see the, the kind of big masts, and these big steel discs allow for detailing, allow plenty of room for each of those cables to resolve themselves uh, in, a, in a pin detail without sort of getting in, in each other's way. Um, did you really need to do this? This building was sort of controversial from an engineering standpoint because this span of about 70 or 80 feet isn't so great that you maybe couldn't have done it uh, in one great big uh, bending uh, structure, or you know maybe really you could have had a, a line of columns. It's really a, a, an expressive piece of engineering, and that's the whole point. It was a semiconductor manufacturing facility, uh, and they wanted it to be sort of technically uh, technically expressive. Again, note the foundations; uh, those have to uh, take the kind of balance between the two edges. And note also out here, we've got a detail at the curtain wall where we have these uh, what look like columns maybe holding up the beams and they're actually mostly uh, holding the beams down, right? Preventing uplift uh, in, the event of, in the event of wind. Can't uh, talk about cable state without talking about uh, some of Calatrava's more dramatic uh, bridges. Ordinarily, you know, we think of Calatrava as maybe a little bit more of a poet than an engineer sometimes, right? His structures can get a little bit out of hand. But some of his cable state bridges have a very, very clever take on uh, how the mechanics actually work. These two, uh, in particular, in Alicante in Spain, and Redding in California, you can see that Calatrava is accepting the fact that he has to have a giant compression piece to take the, the to, to resolve the loads within the um, within the cables, um, and here he's he's basically saying, well, if I have to have this great big heavy structure, I'm going to get as much out of it as I can. And so instead of backstays, you can see that the bridge in Alicante actually balances the tension forces that these cables impart with the weight of the tower itself. Right, the tower is literally leaning back, and the the tower is resisting falling down by the pull that's imparted to it by each of the cables. So a very nice kind of essay in equilibrium, right? That, that you can handle that with backstays and a simple uh, anchorage, or you can think about making the tower itself so heavy that it is going to balance basically the weight of the bridge deck that you see here. That bridge deck, again, is in part a compression element. All of those cables are pulling, they're lifting it up, but they are also pulling on it uh, and putting it into compression. So this bridge deck has to be designed basically as a very, very long column in addition to being designed as a beam. Um, the one in Reading, a little bit simpler, but similar issue. You can see a giant moment connection here. So the, 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 uh, the, the tower here leaning back um, not quite so much of a teeter-totter, but definitely the, the tendency of that tower to fall backwards is being balanced by the pull in all of the cables and therefore by the weight uh, of the bridge itself. You can see there's a little bit of a stabilizing piece right here that's actually doing just a very, very little bit of, of gravity work, right? Mostly that is um, resolving any imbalanced forces uh, that the bridge is feeling because of, uh, because of wind. We can get rid of the, the problem of the, the compression deck by using a suspension cable, but we very rarely see this in architectural applications. One of the few that uh, I know of is this uh, factory building by Nervi uh, in Mantua that you can see uses a suspension cable, right? So not a cable stayed system, not one where the cables are all parallel, but just like a suspension bridge, a loose cable that as you can see is laid out here and during construction it takes a natural catenary shape. Um, when it is loaded, that shape remains a catenary shape, right? It's, it's uh, e evenly loaded across its length, but of course the amplitude will change, right? The, the cable will sag a little bit more. And you can see that uh, basically the weight of the roof over the main span is partly balanced by the weight of the roof on the end spans. Um, but because there's not as much end span in either case, 
the towers are designed just like the towers in the bridge by Calatrava. They are leaning back, right? Uh, balancing some of the, the weight of the roof with the, their own weight. Uh, and they are propped up as well. So they have these kind of legs in back that are preventing them from uh, rotating or moving too much in, in one direction or another. You can see that the roof, therefore, doesn't need to be designed as a compression element. It's being supported at regular intervals by vertical cables, and therefore it's not feeling any of the push or pull uh, that, that the, uh, the cable-stayed version would feel to kind of balance out the, the forces of the cable. Because the cables are strictly vertical, they, of course, are putting uh, their load into the catenary cable above, which changes shape so that every point along it is in equilibrium. But what the roof is feeling is only the kind of vertical support. And that roof doesn't know if it's being supported by uh, cables or by columns. We can design it just as if it was a, a simply supported roof deck, as if it had columns on either side. And here are the interior. You can see the, uh, the, the goal here is column-free space. That's certain, certainly column-free space. Um, like the Rogers factory in Princeton, it's a good question as to whether this is really the easiest way to, uh, to support that roof, whether maybe you could have had slightly bigger columns on either side that would have supported the roof in the short direction or not. For Nervi, he's interested, of course, in expressing, making something structurally expressive. And while this may have been a little bit more uh, expensive, it not only got the column free space that the client was clearly after, but it made for a kind of signature building, right? A, a, a clearly after the look in addition to the, to the function. Okay, we'll leave it there uh, for form active long spans. We looked at uh, compression form active long spans, basically short vaults where we're relying on arch principles and trying to resist the thrust that those arches will give us uh, at, the, at, the, at their ends. And then we kind of flipped that over and looked at uh, tension structures, typically cable stayed in architectural applications, but also literally taking the arch and flipping it over into a tension arch, like that Nervi building, uh, and resolving the inward thrusts instead of the outward thrusts with something like the weight of the tower uh, or balancing cables or something like that. For the last part of this week's lecture, we'll switch gears and we'll go back and we'll review vector active long spans, uh, trusses, but we'll look in particular at what happens when we take trusses and set them at right angles to each other. And just like a kind of really jazzed up waffle slab, we'll look at the impact of two-way behavior uh, on space, on what we call space frames, trusses set at angles to one another. And we'll look at some of the fine points, both of detailing, construction, uh, what we have to look out for when we're taking that principle and trying to hack it with a with two-way performance or behavior uh, instead of just one way.